We've seen in the book of Hebrews over the last two studies that and the he- book of Hebrews presents uh, better things that we as believers have. Now, this was specifically being presented to Israel, to uh, believing Israelis, encouraged them to realize that they had something better now with Christ than they did if they remained living under the law and living, uh, uh, going to the temple and all things that were associated with that. And all of this was based on the fact that Jesus himself is superior. He is God. He did become a man, but he has accomplished greater things, uh, and he is a greater high priest, and he is, now we come to the very end of the book, doesn't just call him a shepherd, but he calls him the great shepherd of the sheep. And we're going to look at what I think this is really referring to here in the context of Hebrews 13. I'm Pastor Tim Holscher, and we've been looking at a number of different offices or ways in which Jesus Christ has functioned throughout history, different things he has done or is still doing at the present time. And we started with this idea of Christ being the great shepherd in the Gospel of John. We're going to go over to the Gospel of John for a minute, John uh, chapter 10. And Jesus is the one that uses this this illustration of himself as the great shepherd or the shepherd of the sheep. And he says, uh, the shepherd of the sheep, this is from verse 2, it says, the shepherd of the sheep and to him the doorkeeper. Now, this is the doorkeeper of a of a fold that multiple people use. So there's a group of, of mixed sheep in there, mixed um, sheep and perhaps goats too, but sheep is the what he's emphasizing. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he, now notice this, leads them out. And when he puts forth all of his own, then he goes ahead of them. Now we've seen in here that one of the things a good shepherd does is he gives to the sheep eternal life, gives them abundant life. He lays down his life in their place. But at the beginning of this, just as the man that was blind in the previous section, and all of this is one section together, there's not, there's probably no time break. This this discussion on being the shepherd probably takes place immediately. And what I'm saying immediately within the same paragraph or two of his conversation with the uh, the man born blind and with the religious leaders as a result. And the religious leaders have thrown the man born blind out of Judaism. They've cast them out. And we have that down here, this ekbale or ekbalo is the, is the Greek word or Greek verb, but the form ekbale, that they have cast him out. They cast him out of Judaism. They cast him out of the temple. He's not supposed to be there anymore. And the reason for that is because he was willing to admit or accept the fact that this Jesus was indeed the Christ, that he was exactly who he said he was. So they cast him out. Jesus on the heels of this now says, I come to this sheepfold and I call my sheep by name. I, or the shepherd leads them out. And when he puts them forth, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, all of this, I believe, is going to come back to what this is referring to here in John 13, verse 20. Now, let's read the whole passage. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. That eternal covenant has to do with Jesus Christ being this this shepherd who lays down his life and is able to give then or share with the sheep his kind of life. That's how you and I have eternal life, is that the shepherd dwells in us and gives us eternal life. You can look at that in 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 11 and 12. And that's part of this a covenant that we would understand that the Father uh, and the Son uh, made together, that the Son agreed to participate in this, and there was something that he would get out of it. He would be this shepherd of this flock of sheep. Now, back over in John 10, if we were to keep going down through there, he tells them, I have sheep that are not from this fold. I must get them and bring them, and we're now going to put these together. There'll be one fold. Now, he's not talking about bring them into this fold that I'm taking these out of. He says, I'm leading these out of this fold. He says, and when he takes them out of that fold, then he goes before them. Then he goes and brings other sheep. So he's taken some out from this fold in John 10. 
He's gone and gotten other sheep that are not from that fold, and he's bringing them together. Now, I believe what he's really talking about, he's given us an illustration. He's not going to talk about this because all of this was at that time what Paul calls a mystery. That is a truth that was not revealed at that time. So he's simply given an illustration of something that will come, but those people wouldn't have understood what he was talking about at that time. But this is the point, and it's it's uh, it specified or clarified uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 that he took some from the Jews and some from the Gentiles and put them together in one new man. In the context of John 10, he takes some out of the sheepfold of Israel, just like this man has been cast out of Judaism uh, by the religious leaders. So Christ is going to lead his sheep out of that. He's going to go and get other sheep and he's going to put them together and he's going to form a new fold, one fold in that context. Now, the problem or the reason that this is important in understanding what he's doing here, what he's talking about, is that the the Hebrew Christians that Paul is writing to here in the book of Hebrews, and again, I'm not going to debate or argue whether Paul wrote it. I just accept that that's true, and we could maybe look at that another time, but it's not pertinent to this discussion. But but thinking that if that this letter is being written to Hebrew believers, they are struggling with leaving Judaism. A lot of people say they're going back to Judaism. They've never left. All you have to do is read Acts chapter 22, and you can see these, or Acts 21 and 22, you can see that these Hebrew Christians never left Judaism. They always had one foot in the body of Christ or in the church, and one foot in Judaism, and they were playing both ways. They were trying to live by grace and trying to live by law. There's actually an illustration of that in in uh, chapter 12 that about it's having like lame knees and bent hands and you're on a path that's crooked and, and meandering and it's hard to operate because they're trying to do both and it doesn't work. And so he uses a couple of, I think, very pertinent uh, a very pertinent illustration, to, first of all, in Hebrews 11, verse 8. This would be the, the this is the person with which Judaism begins, or it, the it, nation of Israel begins here, with Abraham that is called. He was their father. And so he says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed, going out, going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Uh, for he was looking for a city. And if you went back to the last chapter, we could see that that city would be the New Jerusalem, or actually the next chapter. But the point is, Abraham obeyed. He went out. These people are afraid to go out. They're afraid to leave Judaism. They're afraid to listen to the voice of the shepherd that's calling them out of the fold of Judaism to go with him to a place that they don't know. This is completely foreign to think about operating outside the boundaries of Judaism. It's such a foreign concept to them. It shouldn't be hard for us to see because there are lots of Gentile Christians today that are so superstitious about Israel and Judaism that they want to go back and they want to try to pretend that they're Jews. They want to act like Jews. They want to keep the law because we they're wrapped up in this situation that doesn't exist for us anymore. And he's saying, Abraham went out, your father went out. In fact, it even tells us he even had time to look over his shoulder if he would have wanted to and think about where he came from and return. But he didn't because that's what they're doing. They're looking over their shoulder, looking back because they've, they've kind of been pushed out of Judaism by these people, much like that the blind, mind, the blind man in John 9 and their frustr and in their frustration, they're looking over their shoulders, thinking, "Well, let's just give up on getting together with believers, and let's just stick with Judaism." So, in that sense, they are going back, but that's only because they've been pushed out. They've been forced, not by God so much, but by the Jews themselves, to really choose. It's us or it's us or them. You you have to decide. You go to Hebrews, back to Hebrews thirteen, but earlier in the chapter. 
He uses the illustration of where the parts of these animals that were sacrificed, where they were burned outside, the hides and such. And he says in verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify or set apart the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. The gate, <laughs> interestingly enough, you're talking about the doorkeeper to the fold. The gate is a picture of Jerusalem which is a picture of Judaism. If you need to look at that, just go to Galatians 4, where you see Paul use that illustration of the difference between the city, which is the new Jerusalem, and the earthly Jerusalem. But anyway, go outside the gate, and so let us go out to him outside the camp. Camp, again, was an old reference to Israel before they actually had settled down in their land and they were moving about in the camp. Let us go outside the camp, bearing his reproach. In other words, yeah, there's going to be insults. There's going to be hostility when you leave. But you know what? You need to go out and bear his reproach. Was he insulted? Did people treat him verbally with great severity? Yeah. In addition to the physical mistreatment at the cross, he also received tremendous verbal abuse. And he says, you're going to bear that also. And there'll probably be some other things that'll come along with that. But let us go outside the camp. This is the call. The shepherd is standing out. The, he has suffered outside the gate. He's calling his own sheep to come out of the fold of Judaism and come out to something new. It's time to leave Judaism with all of its rules, with all of its regulations, the entirety of it. That means... Mm, don't be offended. That includes the Ten Commandments. They are not an eternal code. They were part of that law system. In fact, you and I really, if you really live the way God wants you to and you live by grace, you don't even live by the Ten Commandments. You know why? Because you don't need to. Because you follow the lead of the Spirit and the Spirit never leads you to violate any of the things that would be in there. So you don't need that code. But those are studies for another time, and we've touched on that in a number of other studies on Living by Grace. And you can look up the playlist on Living by Grace if you would like to go back and review some of those things. But the point being is, Christ suffered outside the gate, you come outside the gate, you come outside the camp. Because if you want to relate to Christ as the great shepherd of the sheep, you need to leave and follow him. Now, I think there's, I, and I mentioned this maybe the other day, but I think that there's some parallels even in our modern culture. Um, my wife and I've had friends, we've had people that we've known that have been saved, but they've been in religious groups. Um, some of them would call themselves churches or, or Christian. They're, they're not, but... Um, uh, and I, I pastor a church with the name Baptist out front, but I can guarantee you, I know Baptist churches where I don't think the people inside are believers because I I don't even know that they really believe in Jesus Christ in the sense that, that we believe in Jesus Christ. Anyway, without picking at that, I'm just trying to say whatever kind of religious group or institution uh, people might have been in, they get saved out of that. They actually come and hear about Christ's death for their sins, his burial and his resurrection, and they believe that and say, that's it. That's 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 all there is. And they believe that for themselves. And they become believers. They become saved. But then they struggle with the fact, now I have to leave this, and this is where my friends are. This is where my family is. This is where my life has been. And I have to make this break. And some believers walk away from it. And they're like, yes. But some believers really struggle with stepping outside. And so maybe a modern, maybe a modern way that this, this fits this type of a situation would be believers today realizing that the shepherd stands outside of those things and calls them to come out to him. And be part. They're, they are, in one sense, they're part of the fold, but on a very practical level, they're, they're not part of that, that sheepfold. Why? Well, because they're not really relating to other believers for the most part. They're sticking with something that doesn't present the true Jesus Christ, presents salvation by grace through faith. They're not relating to these things. They're sticking with a system that emphasizes works and all of these things. All of this just again to remind us as believers, Christ as the great shepherd of the sheep has something for 
all believers to follow his lead as the great shepherd to something better. And that better thing is found as we relate to who we are in him at the Father's right hand. The Spirit leads us there. That's a different matter. But the great shepherd as the sheep, he also then, this is what he wants for us to do, is to be led outside of this or outside of wherever we have come from and to be led into this great fold of the sheep this under that's being led by the great shepherd of the sheep namely namely the church the body of Christ whatever and I'm not talking about church as a specific branch of the church a specific denomination we're talking about that group that's comprised of all true believers from the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 until whenever Christ comes back this is what the great great shepherd of the sheep calls you and I as believers to be part of. That's something to think about where he says, this, this, this is where, this is where you need to be not over there and not over there. You need to be here. So I hope you think about that wherever you are. This is again, a a good reason we're on a practical level for you to make efforts to assemble with other believers. Maybe you can't assemble with them on a Sunday, but maybe there's a Tuesday night or some other evening of the week or some day during the week to sit down with other believers and encourage one another, to teach, share in teaching, to share just in fellowship. And so I encourage you to do that wherever you might be. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember our great shepherd of the sheep and uh, remember where you sit with him. As always, thank you for joining me.